Good morning, dear colleagues. That's my pleasure to welcome you here at our forum, and I want to thank wholeheartedly the European Oncology School for the invitation to speak up here at the conference. Hopefully, I can stand up to the first magnificent lecture by uh, David uh, Zaritza. I also have my presentations in English, uh, well, actually both in English and Russian. I'll speak in Russian. I represent the Petrov Oncology Institute and Tampere Institute, Tampere University. A small overview of my presentation. I will talk about the theoretical considerations of lung screening, and I will proceed with the, the methods of uh, lung cancer screening. These are the X-ray uh, fluorography, which is still quite popular, and I'll explain the reasons why they should not be there. And then we'll proceed with computer tomography, and uh, we'll go into details of that. All the uh, data I show you are based upon the following references, uh, sources. These are the NLST study and Nelson study in the Netherlands that and uh, beyond in Europe general that will be published soon. And I will also uh, rely on some minor uh, tr uh, trial that we had in Samara and Kanti Mansisk in Russia, made by Cancer Prevention Fund and GE. The first uh, important uh, item here uh, is the uh, criteria of effective screening that were designed by Wilson, Jungner, and published by WHO. It's important to meet the uh, targets and uh, the uh, objectives of uh, this criteria for screening to be effective. If I list them, these are the, uh, the uh, disease, which, is, uh, sh which should be a, an important problem in the healthcare, no national and global healthcare. The uh, development of disease should be well studied. The uh, disease should have an early stage. The intervention at early stages should be effective. The diagnostic test should be uh, accessible. And the test uh, should be applicable at the early stages of the diseases, which is uh, perfectly suitable for lung cancer. There should be also certain intervals, time gaps between repeated screenings. The test should uh, do more good than harm. It should have an adequate price, an adequate cost, and what's important, it should be tested in controlled, randomized trials. Why do we need that for the um, systematic uh, screening. There are certain screening biases that are quite typical here. Imagine these two lines are two universes where we do and do not have screenings. The first uh, bias we can make here is length time bias. Imagine the universe without any screenings. We have a tumor, we have symptoms, we put the diagnose and we uh, treated the uh, disease. Imagine we have another universe with screening. We have a tumor, but due to screening, we could uh, find it at the earlier stages. So we treated him and we had a healthy patient in both cases. If we, however, consider mortality or survival rate, the uh, survival rate for the universe with screening is higher because we uh, find the disease at an early stage. But that's not quite true because the screening does not influence the survival rate at the end. With lead time bias, the um, early screening does not uh, 
change the outcome of the disease. So we can uh, treat the patient for a longer time, but again, we treated him for a longer period, we spent more money, but the outcome is death. Well, to put it in a simpler term, there is the concept of uh, fast-growing and slow-growing tumors. There is the um, cartoon about a rabbit and a turtle. In this cartoon, turtle wins, but imagine uh, you're standing here at the start line, and if you get distracted, um, but the chance that, and you're you're just an observer, and imagine you're watching this too. Of course, you will see the turtle better because it moves slower than a rabbit, but it does not mean that turtle will get faster to the end. Quite the opposite, actually. So with the screening, there is also the overdiagnosis bias where we spot the reasons that would never result in uh, cancer death. There are other types of biases um, that could happen unless we have high quality randomized trials. So what do we need to do? We need to have randomized control trials and we should consider mortality as the outcome. It's even better to consider the overall mortality rather than lung cancer mortality specifically. We need to understand that screening has certain harms or disadvantages. We can have positive results, but these could be also false positive results that will uh, bring about uh, excessive biopsies, other types of manipulations, interventions, surgeries, and so on. We can also have false negative results when uh, the um, computer tomography shows uh, nothing and the patient remains untreated. There are other harms. These include psychological stress and screening costs. That's a very a simple uh, chart introduced by uh, Russian Dr. Wagner that shows that if there are no radiological signs and uh, no symptoms, no, that's the first stage. The second stage is when we have radiological signs but have no symptoms. And at this very stage, we need to catch the tumor and have an X-ray for that. And there is the third stage when we have radiological signs and symptoms, but that's the third stage when it's already too late to do something. What are the advantages of X-ray? It's a relatively simple, safe and cheap uh, method, and uh, as a plus, we can also detect uh, TBC. The disadvantages, uh, subjective interpretation and problems with less than one centimeter nodules. If we consider St. Petersburg uh, region, in the 60s, TBC was a major challenge, and uh, all the screening methods were aimed at identification of TBC. So mm, that's how we uh, realized that that was the time when we realized that X-ray for TBC can also find lung cancer. And in the course of time, TBC rates go went down and lung cancer went up. So we started to diagnose more lung cancers than TBCs. That means that the um, that uh, findings or the uh, observation levels of lung cancer in uh, St. Petersburg 
were hired due to screenings, but it's important to understand that it does not impact mortality. So I want to repeat once again, screening has no effect on mortality whatsoever. And that was uh, shown in the six uh, randomized trials that we had back in the 60s. That's the meta-analysis, and we had no differences between the two groups here. But, that's, that, but that was not enough for us, and we made a more recent trial that showed pretty much the same result, the comparison between X-ray and uh, cytology. The outcomes were published in 2011, and uh, that showed no difference between uh, experimental groups with screening and uh, control group without at all, so there were no difference between them. So I'm not an expert in X-ray, but I think that as far as TBC uh, is concerned, it's not really effective there. But again, TBC is an infectious disease, so I think uh, there is no point to have X-ray for TBC because the uh, morbidity rate uh, is not as high as we had in 1960s. So I think we should not all have it uh, every single year as we do now in Russia, because uh, it's um, an X-ray, um, it's radiation exposure, and we should not risk uh, that often. But uh, again, we do have it still in Russia, and I think we should reconsider that. That's the computer tomography screening that became popular after NLST trial. That was the randomized trial for people aged 55 to 74. There were two groups, um, LDCT or X-ray in one-to-one -one ratio and the uh, nodule over four millimeters was considered positive. I guess everybody has ever seen uh, these results that the uh, number of deaths in the group with low dose CT was uh, lower than compared to regular chest radiography. So it's quite a stunning result because we don't get 6.7% uh, that often. That's the updated analysis published in 2013. It's not stated that clear. However, here the risk ratio is already 0.84. That means that the risk reduction was 16%, whereas previously we had 20%. It doesn't change the situation that much, but that's more accurate data, I would say. That was not the only screening study. There were some European ones with lower number of participants. But anyway, that was quite profound, and um, it was shown that LDCT is not a silver bullet, so further population screening is needed. That's another major study made by Nelson. It's still ongoing in the Netherlands. In the control group, there were no uh, tests, only recommendations on smoking restrictions. 
and uh, in the other difference is that here they calculated uh, the volume, not the size of nodules. That is not the only study that takes place in Europe. There is also the Dante study. To be uh, frankly, uh, this one shows no positive effect of uh, LDCT. However, the sampling here is not really big. Maybe it's not enough to show the difference. Anyway, all the data of European studies will be further accumulated and we'll get the aggregated results. Um, screening with LDCG, what can we find there? I guess if you work with uh, lung cancer patients, you often see pictures like these. These are pictures that we were that we got in our studies. Here you can see relatively small nodules or lesions that can be found with LDCT. Uh, here you can see a really tiny nodules here and there. In fact, it's really difficult to spot the nodules with one scan only because vessels uh, also look the same and you should be really experienced in order not to disregard them in order to spot them carefully you can also practice to spot the nodules how many of them do we find quite a few uh, according to certain outcomes Almost 25% of screened person show the nodules. With computer tomography, we started to see many more things. And it turned out that aged smokers have quite a number of lesions in the lungs, which is not a surprise. I'll show you what types of lesions these are. Uh, what uh, shall we consider as a threshold? If a threshold of the node, nodules zero, the share of them will be higher. But if the threshold is five millimeters, the number of them will be less. This study is Nelson's study. Nodules uh, that were detected in 50% of patients. We should remember algorithm uh, as to the uh, volume of uh, nodules, uh, approximately 80%. Uh, these detections are negative ones. Uh, there is intermediate part. It's a difference from the American study. And under the repeated examination, non-invasive, on 97.5% negative, the share of positive from the first group, only less than 2%, and this more than 2%. And out of this positive, only 3% is uh, the lung cancer. You know how we should select the patients with uh, nodules. The, for them, uh, the algorithm is developed. In our study in Samara trial, I think the Russian preparation of smokers, uh, not different from the smokers of all over the world, we found out that 40% of smokers, they have some lesions in the lungs. Next point, what we identify. When we are talking about uh, malignant tumors, in Nelson uh, there were cancers detected during screening, but uh, there were tumors that were intermediate, intermediate interval tumors. Uh, we should understand that they will be present in any screening programs. And it's not always uh, the guilt of an X-ray specialist. Uh, let's remember, uh, let's recollect uh, this uh, 
picture because there are fast growing and slow growing tumors let's look uh, what kind of tumors were interval tumors or uh, what screening tumors among interval tumors advanced tumor advanced tumors and small cell tumors Adenocarcinoma were identified more frequent in screening comparing to uh, interval cancers. In Russia, what data, uh, the data we received uh, during the following up of patients, only 5% uh, there were real tumors out of 300 and something uh, patients relate, uh, exposed to the low dose CT. Next question, can we how, somehow to understand whether this nodule benign or malignant? A Canadian studies publicized in 2013 said that we set a great number of prognostic factors uh, that related to the specific characteristics of the nodules and the patients. If we combine them in a certain algorithm, we can calculate the probability of the fact uh, that the nodule we see may be malignant or benign. The most important thing is uh, the size of the nodule. The larger the size, uh, the more probable uh, this is a tumor. Uh, automated systems are used. Uh, is, uh, the first phase uh, was available for a long time, and the system f it on itself uh, finds uh, the nodules in the lung, but sometimes it may find something else. Uh, the second, current modern systems, they may classify the nodules, may help to an, a specialist. The study that was published in June, several weeks ago, Nelson study, it says not about the nodules that were identified during the first round of examination, but during the thir second, third of examination. New nodules, uh, they were not present in the patient and they appeared. According to this trial, they uh, uh, they uh, introduce uh, the new concept of volume. What kind of volume should be considered, uh, what kind of nodule should be considered as uh, the tumor nodule? It's better to use 27 millimeters. We saw the nodule in the lung. What? What's next? Some of them may be benign. We can't operate all these patients. And what to do in the trial analysis? To all, pa all patients should be sub exposed to the second examination, either X-ray or CT, repeated CT, or maybe PET CT. Mostly, it was conducted in the most suspicious group that later on proved to be the lung tumor. Only in 36% biopsy was performed. We know that external localization tumors, uh, the first that a doctor do, first of all to do biopsy, uh, with the lung, with lungs, uh, the nodule is located in the chest to take the sample, uh, we should penetrate uh, the thoracic wall to get into the pleural cavity. Uh, there may be a great deal of complications. One more uh, study, ILCAP. All the nodules, more than 15 millimeters, were uh, sent to biopsy. Biopsy was not difficult, practically. In all these cases, sixty. Uh, the samples were taken uh, in 62 t patients or out of 81, and uh, this it's possible to do. This is an example of uh, our establishment. 
the work was conducted in oncological center in St. Petersburg. The higher the, no the larger the nodules, the higher the probability to get the sample from the nodule, and it's quite logical. The sizes of the nodules, did it influence the adverse events? The main adverse events, pneumato pneumothorax, uh, that uh, not in every case uh, relate, uh, required drainage and uh, uh, resolved uh, blood spitting, bleeding. Uh, the more the distance from uh, the nodule and the parietal pleura, the higher were the complications. Uh, and especially when localization was at the lung root. You just imagine you have to reach the lung root to find the bulla, to, to rupture the bulla, more complications. If we, talk, if we take Nelson, the majority of nodules uh, that were identified, they were peripheral ones. This diagnostic algorithm during lung cancer screening is justifiable. And if we calculate everything, the effectiveness is not changing greatly. Of course, uh, there are complications. So they are going up. But the number of the majority of uh, nodules are located in the peripheral part of the lungs. We conducted this study. How they are applicable? First of all, we should understand uh, that the high-quality trial is not a screening program. It's a different thing because uh, the participants of the screening programs and uh, participants of the trials, they are completely different. It was shown in Nelson study. Uh, patients, they were physically fit, younger. They were more physically active, they were more educated, and they gave up smoking uh, more e easy. But um, the death rates uh, were high in the control group. Uh, and it's un uh, unexplainable. We conducted the study. We have NLST data. The mortality rate decreased by 20%. What's next? We can see guidelines. The guidelines, NLCT publicized this. They recommend to do screening only uh, according to this algorithm. There is another organization in the USA Uh, that gives a uh, uh, recommendation on screening. This organization did, uh, decided to conduct uh, the clinical trial to find out whether or not these criteria are optimal for screening program or not. Many medical establishments were involved. A uh, difficult mathematical model was conducted. A beginning, uh, the age of the beginning of screening and end of the screening, the length of smoking. Uh, the number of years after giving up smoking. This scenario, we conduct uh, the screening program 60 years of age, 40, and the patients uh, who uh, gave up smoking 10 years, for 10 years were not included. And we, uh, s we saw how many uh, lung, prevention, lung cancer preventions. We are uh, draw this line, mortality rate and screening rates, it's optimum. This point, it's an NLST, it's not optimal point. We started to look for a nearest optimum po point, 55, 80 years. We can see that the publication of the next recommendations uh, they are very important for the USA uh, while deciding who sh should be subjected to screening or, or who not. And they uh, stipulated 80 years. They considered that it's uh, the most optimal age for screening comparing to an LST. Uh, this year, the study 
published. The idea is these recommendations, they may be not optimal too. Why? Because in different groups, the effectiveness may differ. And it was showed by uh, an LST study trial in women. It turned out that uh, the difference uh, uh, between groups large, uh, larger comparing to men it, it's one of the examples. The gender may influence the effectiveness of screening. How can this be explained? For example, I don't, I don't know how to explain that the survival rate uh, of women are uh, higher uh, comparing to men if the uh, stage of the, the disease is the same. And not only gender influences the effectiveness of screening. According to the NLST data and a PLCO screening, they tried to find out uh, uh, that the highest uh, the risk group in the development of uh, lung cancer, the higher the effectiveness of the program, screening program. If we en enroll only enroll the high risk group or the effectiveness of screening will be higher or comparing to uh, overall population if we divide all the population risk population in five parts we can prevent five forty percent then the second part 73 percent can be prevented of all the mortalities thanks to this program and then if we add more and more less risk groups, uh, we will have these figures. What kind of criteria can be used? First of all, it's age, the gender, uh, the length of smoking, comorbidities, uh, the chronic obstructive lung disease, uh, the uh, and uh, cancer history, family history, the early beginning of the lung cancer in the relatives, all these risks of the lung cancer development. If we uh, combine everything, we can calculate the absolute risk of the development of lung cancer. Uh, specificity, sensitivity. This algorithm uh, works quite well. It's uh, the same screening test, but based on the questionnaire. It may be effective. And the simple examples that were made by the authors uh, are as follows. For example, a woman aged 65 with 37 years smoking history had almost 9.9% 9, 9 of risk. And men aged uh, 67 without smoking history had 6% risk. And third example, a man aged 73 who has smoked for 59 years uh, also had an early onset uh, with uh, difficult family history had 29%. So you can see that examples can be really different. That's the uh, pretty much uh, similar example, but the, this one shows a new optimal curve. And here the number of uh, screen patient shows also shows the uh, number of people where these those risks could be prevented. And that's uh, the number, that's the percentage of deaths that can be prevented. It's roughly 55%. If we take the optimal algorithm with the same number of screened people, we can prevent more lung cancer related deaths. What were the indicators used for this study? age, sex, race, education, BMI, back per years, um, emphysema, years smoked, and so, and so on. 
And my last point in the case is costs. That's the cost per each screened person if we calculate the overall costs for CT screening and uh, radiographic screening. That's uh, consequently the curse, the cost per year of life. This indicator was different for different age groups. So that was like 43,000 for smoking people and as high as 147,000 for males. So that's maybe not that much for the United States, but for Russia, that's a lot. And people here at the local conferences say that it's extremely expensive. I like this picture because uh, expensiveness uh, is always compared with something. And as this uh, famous movie Tells for Athos this is too much, but for the uh, La Faire this is too little. So we should always have a comparative uh, cost of screening. Let's consider that screening reduces costs for camo and uh, radiotherapy, which is quite logical. And that's the calculations that were used for the studies. For I, for example, work with bronchoscopy a lot. I would be happy to have um, bronchoscopy at 400 US dollars. But look, the, look at the price of chemo and radiotherapy. If you consider other types of treatment, you'll get the idea of how much it can cost. However, that was n not the only study where costs were calculated. There were some similar made for chemotherapy, for vaccination and so on. I like the lower, the lower indicator. That is video assessed TS compared to open surgery. There were studies that uh, the price of that is fifty six thousand uh, uh, dollars per each life saved, although I'm not sure that as far as saved lives are concerned, VATS has major difference compared to open uh, surgery. David also told about that that what happened to people when they quit smoking during screening procedures the this uh, X shows quit years. Uh, this X shows uh, back years. This 3D model shows that the uh, risk goes down for both axes for quit and back years when a person quits uh, smoking during screening. That's the data for chest X-ray and the CT, the same tenor study. There is the synergy between the computer tomography and the quit period. That's a very important finding. And you can see it here. There's the low dose computer tomography group. For example, each five years, the risk reduces by almost 38%. That means that the low-dose computer tomography and quitting can produce synergy and better effect than each of these separately. My presentation was really long, but I want you to take these home messages. First, fluorography X-ray should not be used for screening for different age groups and the males and females. Low-dose CT does not reduce uh, 
lung cancer mortality screening is not the most expensive prevention way. There are some more expensive patients should be selected for screening. We should not take all of them. We should be much more flexible and consider the risk models. And lastly, smoking, quitting together with screening can be twice as effective as each of them separately. So every screening procedures should uh, encourage smoking quitting. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. To my mind, that's an exciting presentation. I was excited to learn your ideas about LDCT for smoking. Do you have questions? What do you think about the X-ray methods as the only method to identify asymptomic lung cancer? But that was the whole point of his presentation. He said that X-ray methods do not work for that. Here I disagree with you because for asymptomous nodules, X-ray is the only method to diagnose them. What do you mean by X-ray? Do you mean fluorography or uh, radiography or also computer tomography? I mean uh, radiography in both uh, from both sides and the low dose computer tomography that we don't have here in Russia. Once again, that's one of the take home messages that I want to tell you with my presentation. Can we have the last slide, please? There were six randomized control trials made that studied the X rate efficacy for reduced mortality. Not a single one showed reduced mortality with X ray. It is not effective no matter how strong we want it to be so. I just want to add. I believe, Mikhail, Ivan, believe that no, your personal opinion is out of consideration here. There was a long, detailed presentation for an hour that proved that X-ray cannot substitute CT. Fluorography and radiography do not reduce lung cancer risks, and whereas criteria for effectiveness of screening is to reduce mortality and not the survival rate. That's the proven fact. That was not Anton who said that for the first time. He told about six randomized thirds. You can agree or disagree with that. You can insist on your opinion, but I encourage you to reconsider it because, because it should prove on, on evidence medicine and not your personal beliefs. Thank you. Once again, how, uh, what was the population? What was the sampling of these trials? In those studies, you mean? In those? Well, to my rough estimates, there were many thousands of uh, subjects. Now, could you please give me a precise figure? 29,000 here, 4,000, 3,000, 5,000 for two groups, so we can combine them. Sorry. If we 
100,000 for the whole populations. These are just a uh, tiny portion of all people. We could not rely on that. Let us not, Ilya, focus on the uh, pillars of uh, randomized studies. Well, I'm, I, I'll be happy to talk about that in private. I'm not going to dwell on that. No, what I'm trying to say that we should go from heaven to the ground. I'm trying to tell you that X-ray is the only way to spot early lung cancer at the early stage. Hold on. When we select the treatment methods, I think that there is some methodology mistake in these trials, but I cannot tell you where. Well, you'd better find it first and then we'll discuss that, okay? Thank you. And uh, just, uh, uh, in, uh, did you use the uh, contrast fluids uh, in order to specify the diagnosis? Well, different trials used uh, different types of uh, CT. Uh, they always start with a low dose, then they can have either contrast fluids or high dose. So it depends on the algorithm of a trial. Uh, what was the uh, method used for the verification? Was that the puncture uh, for um, these types of cancer? We uh, they sometimes used uh, puncture, but they also used uh, thoroscopy too, and that was shown. Yes, that was shown in the um, in one of the studies and they had the uh, urgent biopsy, thoroscopy, and many other things. I have quite a provocative question, but please answer that. Are you, uh, can you come up with an effective screening program for lung cancer patients in Russia? Thank you for your question. I can suggest certain ideas for the lung cancer screening in Russia, I cannot come up with a unified single procedure because in order to get 20% decrease, we should have a high quality of monitoring, diagnosis, and all the stages. So it it should not be limited by screening only. We should start with pilot trials first and if it works well in certain regions and if it proves that we can have reduced mor mortality here locally then we can extend this experience over the whole country but it takes years and even decades a very good presentation uh, i have a practical question the model of a patient, patient, profile of a patient, uh, he doesn't smoke, how frequently x-ray uh, should be done or fluor should be done annually? No. If he smokes, how frequently should x-ray should be done and fluor? It depends on the amount of smoking. We should develop the available algorithm that is available for specialists so that that can evaluate the risk. To answer the question, if we don't know the history of the disease and we don't have model, we don't. I can't answer the question. For us as outpatient oncologists, surgeons, for example, the average statistics shows that after the 30 years of age, people come up and say, I want to go through a checkup. 30 years of age, a smoking person, we don't recommend screening in Russia, but in the USA, they do the following. If the patient comes, he falls under the criteria 50, 80 years, he gave up smoking more than 15 years ago, uh, the low-dose CT should be conducted. 
Uh, these methods should be uh, tried in our country to be launched. I don't advise everybody to start doing this, but if you suspect the lesion in the lung, a person goes for CT examination. Thank you. Here we have the difference between early diagnostic and screening. Screening is done uh, in case of asymptomatic persons. If we are suspicious, a patient is to be examined further on. Excellent presentation. I have a question. If the screening is implemented, who will be the person to organize? The pneumologists, big hospitals, uh, GPs? What are your thoughts on that? Um, Thank you very much for the question. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a very good question. The problem is with any screening program, and as we look at the United States, it's hospital-based. Uh, it's opportunistic, but hospital-based. If we go to Europe to see other screening programs, it's a population-based. Not every cancer, every program, but still. Well, the, the best, of course, it's a population-based. When it's centrally organized and the patients are invited, selected, and the quality assurance is done uh, at all the hospitals, and it's similar at, at every hospital. Well, it's, it's a best, best scenario. Well, in real life, uh, I, I, I see that soon, sooner or later, hospitals will start offering this service, opportunistic service, and it will be hospital-based with, I don't know, maybe they, I think that cities Scan, uh, computer tomography specialists will start this because it's trend and they, they will start it by themselves, I think. I think that we've had a very fruitful discussion. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the comments. Now we have 30 minutes for rest.